Good morning, my dear professors and colleagues. It's my pleasure and great honor to share with you this very important lecture about what's new in 2019 ESC guidelines on diabetes, prediabetes, and cardiovascular diseases. Our agenda will include diagnosis of diabetes and prediabetes, cardiovascular risk assessment in patients with diabetes and prediabetes, and finally, prevention of cardiovascular diseases in patients with diabetes and prediabetes. How to diagnose diabetes mellitus? According to the American Diabetes Association 2019 guidelines, we can diagnose diabetes mellitus by any of the following. Hemoglobin A1c 6.5% or more, fasting blood glucose 126 mg per deciliter on two separate occasions, two hour postprandial blood glucose 200 mg per deciliter or more on two separate occasions, random blood glucose 200 mg per deciliter or more in presence of symptoms such as polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, or loss of weight. To diagnose impaired glucose tolerance, we should ask for two hour postprandial blood glucose and the cut off value is 140 to 199 milligram per deciliter. To diagnose impaired fasting, we should ask for fasting blood glucose and the cut off value ranging between 100 to 125 milligram per deciliter. So we should ask for hemoglobin A1c and fasting blood glucose as an initial screening for patients with suspected diabetes mellitus. Then if the results of hemoglobin A1c and fasting blood glucose are inconclusive, we can ask for oral glucose tolerance test. However, there are limitations with hemoglobin A1c to be considered, such as interference as a result of hemoglobin variants such as hemoglobinopathy, sickle cell anemia, or thalassemia. In acute coronary syndrome, the oral glucose tolerance test should not be performed earlier than five days to minimize the false positive results because of transient stress hyperglycemia. Our second uh, point is cardiovascular risk assessment in patients with diabetes and prediabetes. We have three risk categories in patients with diabetes. The first category is the very high risk category which include patients with diabetes and established cardiovascular disease, such as cerebrovascular disease, coronary artery disease, or peripheral arterial disease. Patients with diabetes and other target organ damage, such as nephropathy or retinopathy. Diabetes with three or more major risk factors such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, or obesity. Or early onset of type 1 diabetes with long duration more than 20 years. The second category is the high risk category, which include patients with diabetes duration more than 10 years without target organ damage plus any other additional risk factors, one or two risk factors. The last category is the moderate risk category, which include young patients 
with diabetes duration less than 10 years and without other risk factors. What are the recommendations for use of lab, ECG, and imaging testing for cardiovascular risk assessment in asymptomatic patients with diabetes? This class 1 indication to ask for microalbuminuria assessment to predict the cardiovascular events or to predict the risk of developing renal dysfunction. It should be done on routine basis. The second point is resting ECG. It is indicated in patients with diabetes who have hypertension or suspected cardiovascular disease. The third point are the risk modifiers. The risk modifiers include assessment of carotid or femoral plaques by duplex and it is a class 2a indication. The second risk modifier is coronary artery calcium score. The third risk modifier is ankle brachial index. Presence of any risk modifier in patients with moderate risk, we can re-stratify him into high risk. So it help in risk stratification of patients with diabetes who are initially stratified as moderate risk category, then after presence of the risk modifier, they can be shifted to the high risk category. What about screening of coronary artery disease in asymptomatic patients with diabetes mellitus? It is only class 2B indication to ask for multi-slice CT coronary angiography or functional imaging such as myocardial perfusion imaging or stress cardiac MRI or dobutamine echo to screen for coronary artery disease in patients with diabetes. The use of carotid antimamedia sickness is not recommended by the last guidelines. Why it is only class 2B indication to screen for coronary artery disease in patients with diabetes? Actually, the meta-analysis of five randomized controlled trials with more than 3,000 patients with diabetes who are asymptomatic showed that non-invasive imaging for coronary artery disease did not significantly reduce the event rates of non-fatal MI and hospitalization for heart failure. Accordingly, routine screening of coronary artery disease in asymptomatic diabetic patients is not recommended. However, stress testing or multi-slice CT coronary angiography may be indicated in very high risk asymptomatic individual with peripheral arterial disease, high coronary artery calcium score, proteinuria or renal failure. What about cardiovascular risk stratification in individuals with pre-diabetes? Individuals without cardiovascular disease who have pre-diabetes run risk scoring for cardiovascular disease in the same way as the general population based on score system, presence of chronic kidney disease, familial hypercholesterolemia, or other cardiovascular risk factors. 
The third point is prevention of cardiovascular diseases in patients with diabetes and pre-diabetes. To prevent the cardiovascular disease in patients with diabetes or pre-diabetes, we should go through five main lines. The first line is lifestyle modification. The second line is glycemic control. The third line is blood pressure control. The fourth line is management of dyslipidemia. And finally, antiplatelet therapy. The recommendations for lifestyle modifications include diet, exercise, weight reduction, and smoking cessation. The diet is Mediterranean diet, which is rich in polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fat. Exercise should be at least 150 minutes per week. Weight reduction and smoking cessation is recommended as a class one indication. The second line is the glycemic control. We should keep hemoglobin A1c below 7% to decrease the microvascular as well as the macrovascular complications of diabetes. However, it should be noted that the hemoglobin A1c targets should be individualized according to the duration of diabetes, comorbidities, and age. And in all situations, we should avoid hypoglycemia. Hemoglobin A1c target less than 6.5% may be considered on individual basis if it can be achieved without hypoglycemia. Hemoglobin A1c target less than 8% or 9% in elderly with advanced comorbidities is recommended. We should avoid hypoglycemia as it predisposes for ischemia and arrhythmia. What is the classification of anti-diabetic drug? We have five major categories of anti-diabetic drug. The first category is the insulin sensitizers, which include the metformin and the bioglitazone. The second category is the insulin providers, which include insulin, sulfonylureas, and megalitinides. The third category is in creatine based therapies which include glucagon like peptide receptor agonist or dipeptidyl peptidase for inhibitor. The fourth category is GIT glucose absorption inhibitor which is a carbose and finally the renal glucose reuptake inhibitor which are the sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors. What is incretin? Incretin are GIT hormones that stimulate insulin release from the pancreas. It include glucagon-like peptide and gastric inhibitory polypeptide. So, gas, so glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist will stimulate the insulin release. These hormones are metabolized by dipeptidyl peptidase for enzyme. So dipeptidyl peptidase for inhibitors can be used to increase in cretin which stimulate the insulin release. Which drug to start with in patients with type 2 diabetes? We should classify patients with type 2 diabetes into two major categories. The first category 
is the drug naive category. If patients with type 2 diabetes and drug naive, we should look for the presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or presence of high risk or very high risk diabetic patients. If any of the previous criteria is present, we should start with sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor or glucagon-like peptide receptor agonist as a monotherapy, then if the hemoglobin A1c is not controlled, we can add metformin. If the patient is not high-risk patients and no evidence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we can start with metformin monotherapy, then if the hemoglobin A1c is still above the target, we can add dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor or glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist or sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor or cyazolidine dione. The second major category is type 2 diabetes on metformin. We should look for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or high risk or very high risk patients with diabetes. If the patient is high risk or very high risk or there is evidence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we should add on sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor or glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist. If the patient is not high-risk patient and no evidence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we can continue on metformin monotherapy and if the hemoglobin A1c above the target, we can add dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor or glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist or sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor or cyazolidine dione. So what are the recommendations for glucose lowering therapy for patients with diabetes? The first recommendation is for sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor. Embagliflozin, canagliflozin, or dabagliflozin are recommended in patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease or at very high or high cardiovascular risk to reduce the cardiovascular events. While embagliflozin is recommended in patients with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease to reduce mortality. The second recommendation is for glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist. Liraglutide, semaglutide, dulaglutide are recommended in patients with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease or at very high or high cardiovascular risk to reduce the cardiovascular events. While liraglutide is recommended in patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease or at very high or high cardiovascular risk to reduce mortality. The third recommendation is for metformin. Metformin should be considered in overweight patients with type 2 diabetes without cardiovascular disease who are at moderate cardiovascular risk. Insulin-based glycemic control should be considered in patients with acute coronary syndrome with significant hyperglycemia more than 180 mg per deciliter, 
while thiazolidine dione and saxagliptin are contraindicated in patients with heart failure. What are the benefits of the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor versus the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist? Both can reduce the cardiovascular events. Both have renoprotective effects. Both have blood pressure lowering effect as well as weight reduction effect. The mortality benefit is observed mainly with imbagliflozin versus liraglutide in glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist. The major difference between both is the reduction of heart failure hospitalization. There is evidence of reduction of heart failure hospitalization with sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor while this is not observed with glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist. What are the recommendations for prevention and the management of chronic kidney disease in patients with diabetes? Treatment with sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor, either embagliflozin or canagliflozin or dabagliflozin, is associated with a lower risk of renal endpoints and recommended if the estimated GFR between 30 to less than 90 milli per minute. And this is a class 1 recommendation. While treatment with glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist, either liraglutide or semaglutide, is associated with a lower risk of renal endpoints and should be considered for diabetic patients if the estimated GFR above 30. And this is a class 2A recommendation. What are the landmark trials that showed the cardiovascular benefits of sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors? The first trial is the Embarig trial, which showed the benefit of embagliflozin, Declare or DABA heart failure, which showed the benefit of the dabagliflozin, and finally the Canvas trial and the Credence trial, which showed the benefit of canagliflozin. What are the landmark trials that showed the cardiovascular benefits of glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist? The first trial is SUSTAIN trial, which showed the benefit of semaglutide. The second trial is HARMONY trial, which showed the benefit of albiglutide. LEADER trial, which showed the benefit of liraglutide. And finally, the REWIND trial which showed the benefit of dolaglutide. What are the landmark trials of dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors, which is neutral as regard the cardiovascular safety except the saxagliptin, which increase the heart failure hospitalization and should be avoided in patients with heart failure. The first trial is TICOS trial, which showed the benef which showed the neutral effect of cetagliptin as regard the cardiovascular safety. The second trial is Carmelina and Carolina trials, which showed the safety of linagliptin. The third trial is EXAMIN trial, which showed the safety of alogliptin, and finally. A SAVOR TEMI 53, which showed the uh, bad effect of saxagliptin in patients with heart failure as it increases the heart failure hospitalization. The third point in the prevention of cardiovascular disease in patients with diabetes is the blood pressure control. Antihypertensive drug 
treatment is recommended for patients with diabetes when office blood pressure is above 140 over 90 millimeter mercury. The blood pressure goal is to reduce the systolic blood pressure to 160 and below 130 to maximum 120 if tolerated but not less than 120 millimeter mercury as below 120 millimeter mercury there is an increased risk of stroke or renal hypoperfusion while the target for diastolic blood pressure is between 70 to 79 millimeter mercury in addition to the lifestyle changes diet exercise with reduction smoking cessation the recommended drug is ras blocker especially in presence of microalbuminuria or left ventricular hypertrophy it is recommended that treatment is initiated with combination of ras blocker with calcium channel blocker or thiazide diuretic as regard patients with pre-diabetes, including impaired fasting or impaired glucose tolerance, the RAS blockers are preferred over the beta blocker or diuretics to reduce the risk of new onset diabetes. What are the benefits of different blood pressure targets? If we reduce the systolic blood pressure to below than 140 and the diastolic blood pressure below than 90 millimeter mercury, this will be accompanied with reduction of risk of stroke and coronary events as well as kidney disease. While systolic blood, blood pressure reduction from 131 to 135 will reduce the risk of all-cause mortality by 13%. While reduction of the systolic blood pressure below 130 to 120 will be associated with greater reduction in stroke. So reducing the systolic blood pressure to less than 130 may benefit patients with particularly high risk of cerebrovascular event such as those with history of stroke. The fourth point in prevention of cardiovascular disease in patients with diabetes is management of dyslipidemia. If the patient is classified as a moderate cardiovascular risk, the target LDL is below 100 mg per deciliter. If the patient is classified as high risk, the target is LDL below 70 mg and at least 50% reduction from the baseline. If the patient is classified as a very high risk, the target is LDL below 55 mg with 50% reduction from the baseline. If we achieve the LDL target, we should look for the secondary target, which is non-HDL, which is 30 mg above the LDL target. So the target non-HDL is below, the, below uh, uh, 85 mg in very high risk patients and below 100 mg in, in, in high risk patients. Statins are recommended as the first choice for treatment of dyslipidemia. Then if the LDL target is not achieved, we can add ezetimibe therapy. And if the patient is classified as a very high risk patient and he didn't achieve the LDL target despite treatment with maximal dose of statin, uh, in combination with ezetimibe, we can add PCSK9 inhibitors and we can use PCSK9 inhibitors as well in patients with statin intolerance.
it should be noted that statins are not recommended in women of child bearing potential the last point in the prevention of cardiovascular disease is the antiplatelet therapy according to the ascend trial which recruited more than 15,000 patients who are 40 years or more with diabetes and free of cardiovascular disease, which was looking for the role of aspirin in primary prevention. The conclusion of the ascend trial was the primary endpoint including myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, TIA, cardiovascular death, reduced by 12% with aspirin but this is was associated also with 29% increased risk of bleeding there were no differences in fatal or intracranial bleeding and about 25% of the major bleeding were upper GI bleeding so the guidelines recommending aspirin as a primary prevention in patients with diabetes who are classified as high risk or very high risk for cardiovascular events but in absence of clear contraindication for aspirin such as GIT bleeding or peptic ulcer within the past six months or active hepatic disease or history of aspirin allergy and it is class 3 to give aspirin as a primary prevention in moderate risk diabetic patients and it should be considered to give proton pump inhibitor with the low dose aspirin to prevent the GIT bleeding so the summary of treatment targets for management of patients with diabetes systolic blood pressure 130 millimeter mercury for most adults less than 130 millimeter mercury if tolerated but not less than 120 millimeter mercury in older patients who are aged above 65 the target systolic blood pressure ranging between 130 to 139 the hemoglobin a1c target for most adult is below than seven percent we can ask for more intensive control to be less than 6.5 percent if this can be achieved without risk of hypoglycemia and on individual basis or we can allow less control with hemoglobin A1C ranging between 8 to 9 percent in elderly with comorbidity. As regards the lipid profile, if the patient is classified as a very high risk patient, the target is 50 percent reduction from the baseline with target LDL less than 55 milligram per deciliter. In high risk patients, the, the target LDL is below 70 mg per deciliter with 50% reduction from the baseline. If the patient is, modified, is classified as moderate risk patient, the target LDL is below, the, below 100 mg per deciliter. Aspirin is indicated in diabetic patients with high risk or very high risk category smoking cessation is obligatory physical activity at least 150 minutes per week weight reduction and dietary habits especially the mediterranean diet thank you